All right, so yesterday we had a look at the i5-12600K, which is easily the best $300 CPU that you can buy right now. If you're interested, I will have that link down below. But today we're reviewing the big boy, the i9-12900K. And just like the i5, we're getting two different types of cores. Here we're getting eight performance cores and eight efficiency cores. All in all, it's a 16-core, 24-threaded processor, turboing up to 5.2 gigahertz on the performance cores and 3.9 on those smaller efficiency cores. And what's really interesting is that pricing should come in around the $600 US mark. That means not too different to the 12 core Ryzen 5900X and a good chunk below AMD 16 core, the Ryzen 5950X. So let's take a look at performance. I've tested every CPU here paired with an RTX 3080 and 32 gigabytes of DDR4 clocked at 3200 MHz CL14. That is except for the new Alder Lake CPUs where I've primarily tested with a DDR5 5200 MHz kit, but the performance difference between these two kits honestly is not that different from what I've tested so far. Tomorrow though, I will be doing a more focused video on DDR4 versus DDR5 to just evaluate the performance differences a little bit better and especially testing this 6,000 megahertz DDR5 kit from G-Skill, so definitely stay tuned for that. I've also used a 360 mil cooler for all of my testing here, the MSI S360, and that is an important note because the new i9 does get pretty toasty. This will vary heavily between which motherboard you're using and which applications you're running, but here in Blender, the 12 12900K was chugging back around 230 watts out of the box, with CPU temps looking very warm considering that we're using an open test bench with a 360ml liquid cooler. Surprisingly, it gets even warmer when running the new version of Cinebench with power exceeding 260 watts and CPU temps for the performance cores well into the 90s. So is the new 12900K an absolute heater? Is the new thermal interface design just completely pointless? Well, not really, because part of this is just kind of due to the motherboard board's design and how they're configured to run the CPUs, and most of the time it is just completely just suboptimal. We've actually seen the same thing happen with the 10900K and the 11900K, where the motherboards are just running a bit more higher voltage than they really should be. That might be enough to push a Core i9 CPU over the edge, especially when you're running an unlocked power limit. So bottom line, I would highly recommend putting some time aside to better optimize the voltage and power that your 12900K runs at if you plan on buying one, because default motherboard settings are usually very suboptimal. Otherwise, granted that you're not running into any thermal problems, we're looking at boost clocks for all eight performance cores sitting at a speedy 4.9 gigahertz and all eight efficiency cores still running at a respectable 3.7. So what does this mean for production workloads? Well, Cinebench shows just how strong the new i9-12900K actually is, beating the rival 5900X here by a monster 32% and even beating the more expensive Ryzen 5950X by about 9%. As for single-threaded performance, well, that gets even more impressive, about 25% faster than the two Ryzen 9 processors. Absolutely insane when we're looking at Cinebench here. In V-Ray though, Ryzen is definitely a bit more competitive. The 5950X is still the fastest consumer-grade CPU for this task, but the 12900K honestly is not far behind and is a fair bit cheaper. Next up, I compared how fast these CPUs could transcode a bunch of 4K footage using Adobe Media Encoder. The purpose of this is to take heavy, high resolution 4K footage and transcode that to lighter, easier to work with files called proxies, which for some workflows are absolutely necessary. In some video production workflows, especially when you're working with really stubborn compressed footage, this step is pretty much essential and it can take a long time. So transcoding about 50 gigabytes of 4K footage here, Intel's Alder Lake is looking really, really good. Overall, the i9 can save us about five and a half minutes compared to either of the Ryzen 9 processors or another way of looking at this is that we save about seven seconds per gigabyte of footage. So if you're working with 500 gigabytes of footage, for example, which is not too uncommon, almost an hour of time will be saved. We can also see that this workflow doesn't scale that well with big increases in core count, and even the i5 is pretty optimized for this specific workflow. Even in pure video exporting, something that Ryzen has been absolutely dominating in recently, Intel reclaimed their former dominance. Now it's not by much, it's also a year later than Ryzen 5000 and with much more power consumption I will add, but it is a big step for Intel in the right direction. 
rendering performance in Blender is quite similar between Ryzen 9 and the new Intel i9, basically a 15 swing either way. Still though, I would probably pick the new 12900K here if I was building an all out rendering focused machine. You're likely going to be rendering on an RTX GPU anyway, and the stronger single threaded performance of the new i9 means that it can pick up the slack in those other tasks and effects that might be exclusively single threaded. Now let's talk about gaming. Simply put, this is the fastest gaming CPU that you can buy right now, topping the chart pretty much 90% of the time. Having said that, the gains are marginal compared to the one year Ryzen 5000 chips and even over Intel's i5-12600K. In fact, if you're looking for a new gaming focused CPU, the 12600K simply can't be beaten. It's pretty much as fast as the more expensive 12900K in a lot of these games. So we'll move through these gaming benchmarks pretty quickly because honestly, it's just not worth wasting time picking out the 1% or so differences. In the end, it was Cyberpunk 2077 that showed the best performance for the new i9 particularly the 1% low performance, which is about 12% ahead of the two Ryzen 9 chips. Next up, I wanted to test a couple of hybrid workloads. So we've taken OBS and started recording on the CPU and at the same time run the benchmark for F1 2021. And we do get a bit more scaling for the new 12900K, but it's not by a whole lot, likely because the recording just isn't that demanding. What's really interesting though is when we take the proxy transcoding benchmark and run that in the background in addition to gaming, there we see some really interesting results. I'm not sure yet if this is the magic work of Intel's new thread director and the hybrid architecture, maybe it's DDR5 or just poor optimization on AMD's end, but it definitely is a dramatic lead here for the 12900K. Then as for overclocking, I do plan on doing a follow-up video for this one because I do believe there is a lot more optimization to be had for the 12900K compared to what you're getting out of the box. For now though, 5 gigahertz seems achievable on the performance cores while 4.2 seems like a nice bump on those efficiency cores. This was with a load voltage of 1.21 volts, which means both a performance increase and a power decrease compared to what you're getting at stock. Again, follow up video on how to do this will be coming out soon. So yeah, overall closing thoughts, the 12900K is a really solid CPU. It beats AMD's Ryzen 9 5900X in everything, and even the more expensive 5950X in most. In fact, for me at least, this seems like the first i9 processor from Intel that really deserves that Core i9 title. I mean, the 10900K and the 11900K, they don't even come close to the 12900K. This is just a massive step in the right direction for Intel and really some huge competition for AMD. If you are building a new enthusiast grade machine, this is an excellent option. An argument still can be made, of course, for the Ryzen 5950X for some CPU only rendering workflows, but I do feel that the number of those workflows is decreasing as GPU rendering with RTX becomes a lot more popular and significantly more powerful than rendering on any CPU. Like I mentioned earlier, I do think an argument can definitely be made for the faster single threaded performance of the 12900K, which can help uh, pick up the slack in those tasks that aren't as multi-threaded. And I mean, even if you do need to render on the CPU, you still have a monster 16 cores at your disposal, which, uh, you know, let's not forget that it is still cheaper than a Ryzen 5950X. As for whether you should go for DDR4 versus a DDR5 memory kit though, the most economic option at the moment is to go with a low latency 3200 MHz DDR4 kit running that synced with the memory controller in gear one. Not only is that the best value option, but I mean, even when it comes to performance, sometimes you are actually beating a DDR5 5200 MHz kit in some production workloads, only to lose a few FPS when it comes to gaming. Again, more testing coming up, talking about this in depth very soon. And again, just a little disclaimer, AMD are looking to follow up this Intel launch with a 3D cache update for their current chips in early 2020. 2022. So if you don't need to upgrade right away, then I would highly recommend waiting to see what the competition looks like. So again, for production focused systems, enthusiast builds, stuff like that, I would say Core i9-12900K paired with like a 3080, that would be an excellent, say, rendering focused configuration in my opinion. And again, it's just really good to see Intel moving in the right direction with the 12900K. Definitely will leave these linked down below, so definitely check them out. As always, a huge thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.